Hey, uh, just a couple things before we start the message. Uh, we're starting a new, um, a new series on the gospel according to John. And that's the title of the sermon series, The Gospel According to John, because that's what it is. Uh, but we have, we have communion. Uh, we, have, we had a commissioning. There's a lot of stuff happening in the service. And so I just want to let you know these 14 verses uh, that we're going to talk about today. I'm only, I don't, for time's sake, I only have an opportunity to kind of zero down on one or two things here. I'll do my best, but I am not doing justice to this passage. This passage, these, four, these 18 verses, but there's 14 of them that, are, that were world-changing. Uh, they're revolutionary. It's the first Christology that's ever recorded, the idea that God in Christ is God made flesh. Uh, it is, six weeks would not do justice for these 14, 14 of these 18 verses. Uh, and we have 24 minutes. So uh, with that said, I'm gonna offer a prayer and I'm gonna do my, I'll do my best to at least remind you of God's humility but in, in the ordinary, we talked at Christmas, we talked about God, the ordinariness of God's birth and his, his, the fact that God is humble. And if he's humble, he's approachable. If he's approachable, he's knowable. And if he's knowable, he's lovable. Um, but it was ordinary, ordinary peasant boy to an ordinary teenage girl uh, in an ordinary kind of backwoods little village. Um, it's very humble, but extraordinary things. Um, it's, ext- it's extraordinary. I'll do my best to articulate that. Let's pray together. Lord, your word's not mine. Your message for your people, not my message to them. Speak to us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you want us to see and hear and give us hearts to receive your word, your love, your grace, your redemption, your mercy, your hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um. This, uh, this passage, there's some strange concepts in here that you, if, you, if you're not familiar, if you've been around church a long time, you'll understand this because you've been told this over and over. But just to give a, a, a kind of a, a lens to look at this, there's a term in here, like the, first, the very first words is, in the beginning was the word, capital W. Um, that's an unusual concept. It wasn't unusual in, in the Greco-Roman world and the Hellenized culture. It was, it, we have it here in our culture too. We just call it something different. Um, but there was this idea in that culture, um, even within the Hebrew culture, they, they, they spoke, we found lots of documents at, at the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran where people were using the common vernacular, the common way of talking about this concept, uh, even within religious circles. So what the word is in the Greco-Roman uh, mindset is this. There's a, and I, I'm not doing it complete justice, but for the sake of time, um, anything material, anything tangible, anything you can touch or feel, if it's dirt or cement or stone or flesh and bones is considered, doesn't really matter. Some people call it evil, but it just, it's, it's of no importance. But anything that wasn't of flesh, anything that's immaterial, uh, it was considered good. And the, 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 the word that they put on the good or the force, the thing that is beyond us is logos. And we translate logos as word. So there's this concept in the culture of the time, the known world um, of logos, that it's, it's, it's something out there. What John does here is extraordinary because he takes that idea of the word, the logos, and he personalizes it. And they personalize it too. We do this. You know, I, I give you the, the, the way we do this in our culture. When you're watching television, whether it be sitcom, drama, cop show, murder mystery, doesn't matter. You watch it somewhere in the next week or maybe two, you will hear someone say something like this. Well, how did all that work out for you? Well, the universe wanted me, the universe wanted us together. The, the universe this, the universe that. See, we have a natural human tendency to, to, to ascribe will to something that is beyond us. We won't call it God. We won't talk about God with skin on or Jesus made, or God made flesh. We, we don't want to do any of that. But some, somehow, some way, there's something beyond us that wants something good for us or the universe is against me. So we, 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 we apply 
we personify something that's beyond us. The best idea of what the word meant to non-religious people in that culture was the will of the universe. And what John does with it is world changing. He says, it reads like this. In the beginning was the will of the universe. Now I'm not gonna read it like that, but in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God And he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Then he starts talking about, when he he mentions a guy named John here, he's not talking about the author of this uh, gospel. He's talking about John the baptizer. Um, uh, there was a man, uh, there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so, so that through him, all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He, back to the word, meaning Jesus, uh, he, was in, he was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, and this is a very odd sentence for me to read. So um, this, this is what John says. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, just so you know, Pastor Andrew over in Mosaic, probably standing up right about now to preach. The way he's gonna describe that, I wanna give him credit because I think this is brilliant. John is saying about Jesus, before there was a was, he was. That's pretty good stuff. There should be a book and that should be the title. Anyway, um, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The one or no one has ever seen God. This is an absolutely crucial piece of what John is saying. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known. Now we know from the scriptures that any man who would see God would not live. God has appeared in certain forms, burning bush, um, other, other, other places he's shown up either as a theophany or as, yeah, a theophany or some other kind of appearance, but he always took the form that wouldn't kill humanity. Um, here it's saying, no one's ever seen God except God, and that God is now one of us. The word, the will of the universe, became that which it cannot become, flesh, sarks. In fact, the word there, sarks, for flesh is everything that humanity is. And there's something so crucial in there that I can't articulate in, in, in full today, but the, if if Jesus only put skin on, and I know we, I kind of talk about that. It's like God with skin on. If he only put skin on, if he kind of had a shell and, and, and there's an old movie cocoon where these aliens kind of put on a zipper suit of humanity. If that's what he did, we're all doomed because that which was not assumed, that which he didn't take onto himself is not redeemed. So he became everything that humanity is. As much as Adam was human, Jesus was human. As much as you are human, Jesus was human. As much as anyone is human, God became human. There is no difference between the person Jesus walking around on the planet as far as his humanity is concerned and you. God, a creator, the creator of all things, the one who was there in the beginning and through whom all things were made, he became one of his creatures. It is absolutely outstanding, astonishing, extraordinary. There's no way we can put words to it, but John somehow does. Now, if that doesn't really get you, because we're so used to it, we're so, especially those of us who have grown up in church and we've read the scriptures a lot and we've read through the gospel according to John, um, this sets up everything that he's gonna say after this in the book of John. But these, these, these 18 verses, the 14 of the 18 verses, are, we're so accustomed to it that it doesn't boggle our mind anymore. I mean, I am, I am almost trepidatious today, 
even trying to articulate in 20 something minutes what God has done in the person of Christ. So I'm gonna try to just make it simple. Who do you want visiting you in the hospital besides Greg? That's the first thought everyone has, Greg. I want Greg, just don't have him recite the 23rd Psalm because that means I'm going home to be with the Lord. Um, (laughs) If you get a diagnosis that begins with a C, who do you want in the hospital with you? If you get, if you hear that you've got a month to two months to live, it's a tragic diagnosis. Who do you want coming to visit you? If you're a parent and your child is dying on a hot, God forbid something like that would happen to you. But if you're, if you're a parent and you've got a kid who just got hit by a car and they're saying, we've got to do surgery, there's swelling on the brain. We've got to relieve the swelling, but, if, but it might not work. Who do you want to sit with you in the hospital? You want someone who has had a, a child in a spot like that. You want someone who's had a diagnosis much like you. You want someone who gets it. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with the message, but it's just an opportunity to tell Christians what not to do when you go to see someone in the hospital. I've been, I've been injured many times. I've had 14 surgeries. I've sat in a hospital room as a, as a convalescing many times. Michael Cheek, Dr. Michael Cheek, who's done three of the la- three, four actually of the last shoulder surgeries that I've had. I probably bought him. I don't know if he has a cottage, but if he does, I bought it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one of the few people that can say my orthopedic surgeon. Most people don't. They, they have A, not my. Um, but I've been in the hospital room when people come to visit. Uh, one time, near-death experience, uh, my arm. And people come in and they want to make you feel better. And that's, oh, that's nice. But then they want you, the convalescing one, to make the, the one who came to visit, they want you to make them feel good about coming to make you feel better. That it's not the responsibility of someone who's convalescing to make the person who's not convalescing, who's come to comfort the convalescing one, it's not the the convalescent's job to make them feel better about coming. Don't do that. And the reason you want someone who's been through it before visiting you when you're hurting, when you're suffering, joining you in your suffering, being near to you in your suffering is because you don't want to tend to them and they know to keep their mouth shut. They know to sit with you and they know that you know that they get it. God is a God in the person of Jesus who will sit with you in your suffering, who will sit with you in the hospital room and you'll be glad he's there because he's done it. He's hurt. He knows what it's like to be sick. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to sit across the dinner table with someone who's gonna sell him out and make you be, and make Jesus be whipped and scourged and hung on a cross and killed. One of his best friends, he knows what it's like to look at that man in the eye and love him, knowing that he's gonna have you killed. The God that we worship has been one of you. That is glorious. That is world changing, that is life changing, that cannot be, it's almost absurd that the God of the universe would have all of these people that have just been so wayward for so long. And, and, and we, we have this idea that, there, that God is God and he throws down commandments and he tells you to do this and he tells you to do that. And you're like, yeah, but it's so hard. And don't behave this way, don't do this. I know, but it's so hard. We have this idea that, that he doesn't really understand, but God says, yeah, I do. In fact, I'm gonna come and struggle with the same stuff you do. I'm gonna come and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hurt with you. I'm gonna be tortured because someone somehow, some way has been tortured. I'm gonna live it so that you know not that, not, not that there is a God who loves you, but that you can love the God who loves you, that you can know the God who knows you, that you can spend time with the God who wants to spend time with you. If that's not helping, if that's not working, if, that, if you can't get a grasp on that, and I understand it's just, it's a huge concept to try to make small. Let me tell you a story about a, a missionary. His name was Joseph Damien. This is back in the 1800s. And so, and I believe, I don't know my U.S. history that well. I, he, he was in Hawaii, but I don't know if it was called, I don't think it was a state back in the 1800s, but I don't know if it was called Hawaii back then. Uh, I don't know. But he, he served leper colonies um, or a leper colony on Molokai, an island in Hawaii. And... Um, 
he was really, he was very well known by the leper colony. He could have gone anywhere to serve. He was an excellent leader, uh, very organized. He was a very effective communicator. Uh, and, and he was a really good pastor. People, he could have gone anywhere, but he chose, or God chose for him this call to minister to the people with leprosy on Molokai in Hawaii. And, and if you don't know much about leprosy, I know we hear about it in the scripture and we know the, that there's some really bad jokes about leprosy, but um, really what it is, Hansen's disease, and, and there, there's, a, there's a bacteria, I believe it's bacterial, um, but you, you, you get it and it starts to kill off the ends of your nerves, like at the ends of your fingers, your nose, your ears, uh, sometimes your elbow, sometimes on, on your outer surface of your skin and on your toes. And because the nerves start to die off, um, you get injury and then, and you don't notice it. And then injury, so you don't have any feeling there. Injury, your skin gets infected and then your skin necrotizes, it dies. And then little pieces of you begin to fall away. And so your fingers are long and then they become short. And some people are just have nubs. This is a man who chose to be with people that aren't easy to look at and aren't easy to love. And one day when he was getting ready to go and, 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 and provide daily worship services for these people that are, that, are, that are cursed with this horrible disease, he was, I guess he was washing up, but he had some really hot water and he poured it into a bowl, I think, to wash his hands up. And, and some of it swirled out and fell onto his foot. And nothing happened. And he had, if you've ever had that idea that like you, you all of a sudden you're, you, you're running your tongue through your mouth and there's a bump that wasn't there before, or, or you're rubbing, you're scratching your arm and all of a sudden there's a growth on your arm or some, something that, that's, that, that's not supposed to be where it is. And you have that little, oh my God, that little in, in, initial terror, like something, or when you almost have a car accident, you know, and you get that adrenaline surge. It's like, he had that because he knew what it meant. And he took a second and he took the pitcher of water and he poured it on his foot and he felt nothing. Hot water on his foot felt nothing. And then he had to go and lead worship. And he knew that his sermon now was gonna be a little teary. And he shows up and the way he, the way he welcomed everyone, the way he begins all of his worship service leading is as he would walk up to people and he would say, my fellow believers. It's like when I walk up, I'll say good morning, especially on the, uh, in the earlier service. But this time, and it took people a minute to notice, this time he said, my fellow lepers. He had just become one of them. Not of his own choice, mind you, but he had become one of the people that he loved. So much more. God in Christ. So much more. Because he did it of his own accord. From the time history began, the God of the universe decided that at the right time, for all the right reasons, the creator is going to become a creature so that the creatures know that they're loved. And so that the creatures know that their creator knows them. And so that the creatures know their God. Not that they are God, but they know their possessive form of the word God. They know not just who their God is, but they know their God. That is extraordinary. Now we talked at Christmas, those of you who were able to be here, about the humility of God. And John talks about something that's absolutely extraordinary. The ordinariness of Christ's birth, the ordinariness of being born a peasant boy, he was to an ordinary teenage girl in an ordinary village in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. Absolutely ordinary. But the fact that God would do it is extraordinary. And I want to give you a piece, some idea, some sense that God is a God of ordinary things. God is a God of ordinary things, but he uses ordinary things and ordinary people to do extraordinary things or to represent it. I'll give you an example. You guys, here is one I'm sure you're all familiar with. Joshua 4, you guys all know that? Regular devotion, you're always telling it in Sunday school. Joshua 4, no? Okay. Sarcasm is my love language. Joshua 4, God's people, we talked about this with Joseph um, in Egypt and he rescued humanity and, and uh, God's people started off there in peace and then they became slaves and they were slaves for 400 years. 
and God, they cried out to God, where's this God that we heard about that does miraculous things? And he calls them out and he brings Moses and he pulls them out of, the, out of Egypt and the whole Red Sea thing happens and, and he brings them and he's gonna make a people out of them. And he told them that there's a land that I'm gonna give you. It's called the promised land. It's a, a land flowing with honey and you're gonna harvest from vines that you did not plant and you're gonna live in buildings that you did not build. And God has prepared this place for you and I'm gonna make you a people and bring you there and you will worship me and the whole world will know who I am because of who you are. And then they bent their knee to a golden cow that they had just made. And he was, whoa. And he made them wander around the desert for 40 years. Now he did some miraculous things. He kept them from, he, he kept them from, from, from being overrun by warring tribes. Uh, he, he gave them manna and quail every day to eat. And he brought water from a stone. I mean, he just did phenomenal things. But for 40 years, they're, they're wandering around. They finally get in Joshua 4. They finally get to the point where here's the Jordan River. And all they have to do is get across. But, but they hit the Jordan River, which normally is like Pine Creek. It's just not that big of a thing. It's a little muddy river. And you could wade across it. Most of the time, it'd just be knee high. Where they were, it happened to be at the time of year where it's flood stage. So I want you to picture just for a moment what that would be like if you're driving to the beach and you wanna see the sunset and the sunset's gonna happen whether you're there or not, but you gotta see it because the clouds are just right. And you're driving out Chicago Drive and you get up near the West Coast Station where that little curve happens. And, 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 and all of a sudden, and you're driving a little bit faster than you should because the sunset's gonna happen with the sun. You got your camera, you're ready to go. And you come around that, 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 that bend and the railroad tracks are there and all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. Oh. So you do what any red-blooded American will do. Right, you're gonna, you might get a little air on those railroad tracks. But someone in front of you is listening to Christian radio on obedience and they're like, oh. that frustration Take, that's just you gonna miss a sunset. These people, the place that God has promised them, they've been wandering for two generations around, they get their flood stage, they can't get millions of people across, especially the children and all the animals. And so God says, I want you to take the priests, man, pastor types, and I want you to take the ark, this big heavy thing where God lives and put it on your shoulders and I want you to walk into the river. I would not wanna be the first priest. You ever been whitewater rafting? You ever been whitewater rafting and they go, oh, this is Swimmer's Alley. This is on the New River in, in West Virginia. Swimmer's Alley, class one rapid. If you want to try, hop out, get your life jacket, hop out, swim away for 15 or 20 seconds and then try to get back to the raft. Whenever I saw that in a movie, I'm like, just swim. Oh, it's awful. So every one of these people would be, would just be, swept away and here's this priest that has a step. And when he stepped his foot in that water, the water stopped, it dried up and millions of people walk across. God does a miraculous thing. And here's what God says to do. He says, I want you to pick up a rock, one for each tribe out of the river and stack them up. Or there's nothing more ordinary in the Middle East than rocks. There's nothing more ordinary around the Jordan River than river rocks, nothing. And God says, grab, and they're pretty big, but grab these stones, pile them up so that when your children ask, what are these stones for? You tell them what God, just, what God has done. This ordinary thing represents something extraordinary. And same thing right here. Bread is everywhere, everywhere. If you go to Crazy Horse or Olive Garden, bread is a throwaway. They will keep bringing it to you until you don't eat it anymore. And then they have to throw it away. Bread is so common. It's so ordinary. It's everywhere. And it was the same back then. Wine is ordinary back then. We, we you know, we have an age restriction on it now, but back then water often had bacteria or some kind of microbe in it, and it could get you sick. It could give you leprosy. So, so they drank wine because alcohol kills a lot of those contaminants. Everyone drank wine. It was everywhere. And God, in the form of Jesus, who's fully human, he became one of you. He says, one night, he's sitting across the table from one of the guy, the guy that's gonna betray him. And he says, this ordinary, he took it and he broke it and he looked up and he, he blessed God. And, and he said, whenever you do this, remember me. And when you drink, when you eat and drink, Think of me and not think of me in this moment and, and just my sacrifice, but you know me. So when you eat and drink ordinary things, remember the extraordinary thing that God has done. I, says Jesus, became one of you. I know you and you can now know me, the God of the universe. 
It is ordinary stuff, but an extraordinary thing happens in it. Not just that we remember cognitively, but Jesus says, and our tradition affirms that when we take communion, God gives us something we don't deserve. It's a means by which God gives us grace. So when you take an ordinary, and this is a tiny little cube of bread, you take it out of that tree and you hold it until you're supposed to do it, and you put it in there, it just kind of goes away. And you take that tiny little shot glass of juice and you almost wet your tongue with it. It's ordinary and it's small. But what it does and what it represents is a God who loves his people so much that he became one of them. Not so that you would not, not only so that you would know that God knows you, but so that you could know God. Not God, but the will of the universe, but the creator of the universe, who is now tangible, knowable, lovable. He's humble. And if he's humble, he's approachable. If he's approachable, he's knowable. And if he's knowable, he's lovable. Ordinary and extraordinary, married in one person, Jesus, who is God made human. Let's receive what he has to offer us. Let's pray. Almighty God, we bless you. We thank you for being a humble God who is all powerful, but humble. We thank you for that we can approach you as children of God. And we thank you that we can know you. And we're thankful, Lord, that you love us, but we get to love you too. In Jesus' name, for your glory, for your sake, amen. Stand to receive God's final, not his final, he'll keep doing it, but of, for, the, for the service today, his final blessing. We just told in the book of John that he keeps doing it over and over. So look, before there was a was, he was, and he is, and he always will be. And the God who made you knows you and loves you, and the God who made you can be known by you and loved by you. That part is up to you. The Lord has blessed you and he will keep you and he will make his face shine on you. He will be gracious to you. The Lord will turn his countenance toward you. He will smile at you and give you peace. And all of God's people say, amen. Go.